notification yet. Is it coming through yet? Come on, Facebook. Anyhow, welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Uh, this two days before our Good Friday. Remember, Friday night, if you don't have it, if you haven't marked it down yet, our Good Friday service is a reenactment, not, not a reenactment of the Lord's Supper, because they're not going through everything that happened. Each of it's really a a a a live response to Leonardo da Vinci's painting as each one of the disciples speaks in their place that he had put them right. So that's Friday night, seven o'clock. We'll share communion together. Right now it's Wednesday night live, so let's do a little singing. We're going to take our books and turn to number forty-five. Worthy as a lamb, and we'll sing it through twice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength. This is one of those old Sunday night songs we used to sing in the 60s and 70s. 
missionary moment of prayer with Christine. Hello. Tonight we're going to be doing an Options for Women update. Options for Women is a pregnancy center where women can receive a free medical consultation with a second visit ultrasound, pregnancy navigation, and customized support to help make decisions with unplanned pregnancies. Please pray for the many women who come to Options seeking help and assistance. Pray that seeds are planted for their salvation. Please also pray for those who come in contact to support and guide these women. Many need support, a caring heart, and a listening ear. Options is seeking specific prayer for a few infants facing medical struggles. One has kidney complications, two have been in and out of the NICU since birth, and twins are facing real medical struggles. Please pray for the doctor's wisdom, the infants, and their families as they go through these trying times. Please lift up a mother who is going through postpartum and is struggling in the midst of a troubling marriage. Please lift those who are struggling with whether or not to follow through with their appointments. Mm. Please, Lord, guide them to this place where people will uplift and support them in their time of need and confusion. We would also like to lift up the options as they prepare for hosting their annual banquet this year, which is on May 3rd. They haven't had one for three years, so this is extremely important. It's a great informational evening and the biggest event for options to be able to raise their donation support. Please be in prayer for all those who are part of the organization, including our very own Maria Jinian and the guest speaker Ryan Bomberger, and all those attending that the Lord would put on their heart to support this much-needed ministry. So with that, I'm going to close this in prayer. Mm. Dear Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that you have put this ministry so close to home. We thank you that Options now serves in the Trenton and Cherry Hill areas. As a teacher in Maple Shade, Lord, I know how much this benefits those in our community. Lord, I specifically ask you to be with the ones seeking guidance in their decision making. Please not only lead the women who need support to these facilities, but also be with those who come in contact with them. Lord, allow the counselors like Maria to share your truth your love, and help plant the needs to salvation. Lord, we ask that you wrap your loving arms around the infants who are struggling medically. Please give the doctors wisdom to help them as their mothers may be struggling with even giving birth in the first place. We ask that through whatever trial you place in front of these families, Lord, that through it all they get to know you and seek you more. Lord, we lift up Chuck Swanson and pray for the ministry as a whole. We ask a special blessing upon the Options Banquet in May. And we ask that you lead individuals to not only support options financially, but prayerfully. And we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Pastor Greg with some Bible trivia. See if he can outdo me last week. Well, he set the bar pretty high. <laughs> we got the McDonald's. Mignon oh, you don't have, you don't have the uh, McDonald's. I don't know. It's, uh, maybe they're online. We'll maybe have to they're see. playing at home. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Glad to be back with you. You see, I got my Philly shirt on, even though today wasn't such a good outcome. But uh, opening day was just the other day, so we're going to do a little opening day Bible trivia. Okay, oh, yeah. there we go. Not exactly what you might think based on that, but uh, I think you'll catch on rather quickly. All right, so you can play at home by typing in your answers, and sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't. Uh, or if you're here, we raise our hands, everyone. Play some some like some people like to come here and then play at home. Um, so this first one, all you have to do is supply what's missing in the verse. It says, "And God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the blank blank. All right, I'll read it one more time. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the blank blank. Anybody want to give it a shot? Tom? Sure. The first day. The first day, right? First day. Opening day. Opening day. <laughs> the grand the grand beginning. And of course it was in the beginning. So, you know, it has to do with opening day. Right? From Genesis chapter one. And yes, we have a new fellow playing at home, Mr. Frank Bor Borealis. Um, first day. He got it correct. Good job. You got that right since it was the first day. Uh, let's see. We'll give you uh, 250 points there. Just because. All right, I'll go to the New Testament. Okay? So um, I'm, I'm, there's a blank here, but I also want you to tell me who is being referred to in the verse. So fill in the blank, which is not that easy, um, and then tell me who's being referred to in this verse. And he said to him, speaking of Jesus, go wash in the pool of blank, which means sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. All right, so who came back seeing, and where did he go to wash? I'll read it one more time. It comes from the Gospel of John. Jesus said to him, go wash in the pool of blank, which means sent. So he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. So where did he go? Or you can you can tell me either answer if you don't know both, either one. Who, who came back seeing, and uh, where did he go to wash? Dave, which one are you going to give me, one or both? Both. All right, double double jeopardy. Pool of Siloam. Pool of Siloam, and, that's right, correct. And, uh, and Bartimaeus. Uh, no, it wasn't no. Bartimaeus. It but, wasn't Bartimaeus. No, but that's that's good. But now, now Dave said Bartimaeus because at one time Jesus did hear a blind man, and his name was Bartimaeus. He's that's one of the only uh, people who were healed in the Bible that Jesus gives, or that the gospel gives his name. But in this case, that was not the individual. Uh, Bill. It reminded me that Jesus put his foot on his eye. Yes, but specifically, and John tells us, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. This is the man who was blind. Correct. Very good. We have a, we have a new <laughs> attendee, and, and, and right off the bat, she gets the answer right. Yes, it says he's identified as the man who was born blind or, or blind from birth. And if you remember, the disciples were asking, because not because they were sadistic, but at, at the time it, it was kind of a thought that if you were born with some type of disability or infirmity, that God was punishing a sin either in you pre-birth or something that your parents had done, John which was... Nowhere to be found in Scripture, but it became kind of a uh, a thing. So the disciples said, "Jesus, so who sinned, this man or his parents?" And, and they weren't they were they were asking a legitimate question. And Jesus said, "No, neither one. He was blind. He was born blind so that the glory of God could be revealed. In other words, he was born to set up this miracle. Jesus came, and and that, that's kind of hard to deal with. Realize this man. I don't know how old he was, but he was old enough to be called a man, and he spent his life up to that point." without being able to see, so that the glory of God could be revealed. And, and that, that was so. We find that in John no. chapter 9. But yes, it was the pool of Siloam or Siloam, and um, that was the, the name Siloam means sent. And even the name of the pool, it's where Jesus sent him to wash, very specifically. And the, the story gets more involved in that in John chapter 9. If you want to read about it, it's a great story. But opening day for, for that man, because he was born blind, and he could see from that point on. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought it was referring to umpires. <laughs> Does it spit on them? <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. We'll stretch for that one. And for getting that right, we'll give you uh, a thousand points. You're batting a thousand if you got that one right. All right. We'll go back to the Old Testament. All right. All I need you to fill, do is fill in the blank here. He says, uh, "This is God speaking. Go out from the blank, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you." Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. All right? The only hint I'm giving you is in the Old Testament. All right? So just tell me what is missing here. 
go out from the blank. You and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and creeping things that creep upon the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Where did they um, get sent out from? Linda. The ark. Yes, the ark. Opening day, right? They were on the ark. Uh, bonus points. Can anybody tell me how long uh, Noah and his family and all the living creatures were on the ark? Uh, 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that's how long it rained, yeah. but they were actually on the ark much longer than that. Wow. If you, if you, uh, you have to do a little bit of math, but if you look in Genesis chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, you do a little deduction. Anybody want to take another stab before I, I give it? It's not 100. No, it was longer than that. Bill? It was actually one year and ten days. It says they, uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm just saying, the specific answer, it was more than, imagine being on a closed up ship with a bunch of animals that do what animals do. You know, it's, it's like a, uh, a barn at sea um, <laughs> for one year and ten days. Because it says they went in, it was the second month, the 17th day of the month. And the day they came out, it says it was the six hundred. It was Noah's six hundred and first year, so it was a year they were on there, and the twenty seventh day of the second month. So it was a year and ten days. I don't know if that number is significant or not, but that's a long time to be in uh, a petting zoo. Um, it's a yes, <laughs> yes, I'm sure they went through the Febreze. Um, so for getting, if you got that run right, give yourselves uh, two thousand three hundred and forty eight points. <laughs> All right, we'll go back to the New Testament. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing. If yeah, we got some answers. Got some playing at home, yes. We got Ark, we got Mike at 150 days, but, you know. Yeah, what I, okay. Felt like that. It did. It was longer. All right, now, uh, this next one, you just have to tell me, uh, it's a place. What place is being referred to here? Now, I'm going to tell you it's in the New Testament. It says, its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. So the gates are always open. It's opening day, all day, every day, because there's no night there. That's the key phrase. Alma? Heaven. Heaven, or in the, in the book of Revelation, it gives a specific name for this location. Is anybody? She's not wrong. Zion. Zion, or the new yeah, yeah. Jerusalem. Yes. Which all, all those answers are correct, but specifically it says in Revelation that the new city, Jerusalem, actually comes down from heaven onto, onto earth, and that's where uh, Christ actually physically will dwell with his throne. And we'll, this, the gates of the city are made out of 12 individual pearls, but the, the gates, usually back then at night, for protection and for safety, you would close the gates. So that way no enemy could attack, no robbers could get in. But if Christ is there, it says there's no need, right, for that protection. But there's also, there's no night. There's also no sun and no moon because the light emanates from him. So it's always opening day in the New Jerusalem, right? Everything's always open. That's in Revelation chapter 21. If you got that right, give yourself 6,440, 41 points. Yes. <laughs> Is there a method? Yeah, no, you think I'm just making this up? <laughs> <laughs> My buddy's putting in funny answers here. He may be removed from the audience. Um, all right, the next one has two parts. I want you to tell me who is speaking in this verse. It's actually a prayer. It's in the Old Testament. And, and what was the event that he was speaking at? Okay, so let me read it, and then you'll have a better understanding. He, this is a prayer. He says, that your eyes, talking to God, may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. So it was, it was an opening day celebration. I'll give you that hint. And he says this, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, and that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. Who is the speaker, and what is the event that is being spoken at? Bill? I guess Solomon. It was Solomon. The Say it again, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Dedication to the temple. Yes, it was Solomon. Yes. Mike Mullen got that right. Good job. And it was the dedication of the original temple, right? Remember, David gathered the materials, but he wasn't allowed to build. And then Solomon, when he became the king, he set up the uh, actual construction of the temple. And then when he dedicated, they, there was a big celebration. They brought the Ark of the Covenant in. And then it says, when that happened, a cloud came down, a dark cloud, and it, the glory of the God filled the entire temple. 
Um, and then Solomon offered this prayer. I like that. Opening day of, of the temple. And it, it's uh, he, he prayed that God, his eyes would be on it open. Night and day, his eyes would be open towards that house. Mm. Very good. That's in 1 Kings chapter 8, if you want to read more about that. Um, yeah, a few more people about got that right. Joy, good job. And if you got that right, give yourselves 9,992 points. All right, we'll go back to the New Testament here. All right, so there's a couple of blanks. I just need you to fill in the blanks. And then also, I want to know the event that is being spoken of here. I'm into events here. It's another opening day. It says, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the blank, which had been on Jesus's blank. So two blanks there, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. All right, so there's two blanks and the event being referred to. I'll read it one more time. It comes from the Gospel of John. Simon Peeper... <laughs> Peeper, Piper, pick the Piper, pick the Piper. Um, Simon Peter came, following him, speaking of John, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and this, which had been on Jesus' blank, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. All right, Frank Borelli playing at home. He got the correct answer. Um, one of them, anyway. Anybody want to take a shot? Yeah, Dave. Dave? Napkin. Okay. Was covered in clay. Correct. And what was the event? It was the resurrection. Jesus. Absolutely, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, good job, Dave. It was the, uh, the, some versions do say napkin. Other versions will say the face cloth, yeah, right? Yeah. Jesus was, was wrapped, not like a mummy, but in the Hebrew culture, they, they would wrap uh, the body in, in a, in a long linen uh, cloth or, or shroud, um, and then there would be a separate one for for the head, the face covering. So that one, it says, was laying uh, separately, the one that had been on Jesus's head, and it wasn't lying with the linen cloth, but folded up by itself. And obviously, that was Jesus's tomb, and it was the resurrection day. I like John's gospel. I just, I don't know. I get a kick out of a couple of things. First, John never refers to himself. Yeah. He just says the disciple Jesus loved, or that other disciple. And it says, of course. When they found out from the women that were at the tomb that it was empty and there was an angel there, they didn't, of course, they didn't believe them, so they ran to the tomb themselves, and John points out that Peter got a head start, but he got there first. John, <laughs> just, there's, I, just like any other guys, right? Little little, stick, little nudges, little nudges, and, you know, Peter's an older guy, John's a young guy, and, yeah, just just no reason, but I just want everybody to know I got there first. Uh, but John didn't want to go in, right, whether he was afraid or that thought of desecration to, to the Hebrew mind of going into a tomb. But Peter had no such thing. He went all the way in. And I just love that that extra little thing that only John's gospel includes. But right, Jesus, he's resurrected from the dead. After all he had been through, you know, I don't like making my bed in the morning, right? My wife likes it, so I do it for her, but I don't see any point. You're going to get back into it, right? But Jesus, and, you know, he got up from the grave, and the first thing he did, it says he took the head cloth, and he folded it, and he set it apart from the rest. Like, he, he made his bed, and I think part of the reason that I like is he knew he wasn't getting back in, yeah. right? <laughs> right? And, and But I think that was just for Peter, right? Hey, Peter, I'm folding this up so you know that I was actually here. No one, If someone took that body, would they have taken the time to fold up no. the, the head covering? No, Jesus took it, and he said, you, you can do, no hurry, <laughs> you know, fold it up. I don't know why, I just find that very uh, entertaining. So, if you got that right, give yourselves 11,342 points, and we'll move on to the next one. Um, good job. Several people at home got that. Robbie, Joy, Borealis. Good job, guys. All right, this next one. There's two blanks here. I just need you to fill in the blanks, okay? It comes from the Old Testament. He said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of these, and of these, all around Elisha. So what, what were the two things that were all, if you remember the story, it's in 2 Kings where Elisha keeps defeating the plans of, of this one king of, of Aram. And so he doesn't like it, so he sends his troops to, to where Elisha is. It's just a house in a small village, and he sends his horses and chariots to, to circle around the uh, the place where Elisha is staying. And, um, in the morning, as his servant comes out, 
And he, he's scared to death. He goes back in and says, Elisha, they got us surrounded. What are we going to do? Elisha says, don't worry. There's, there's more here with us than against us. He says, Lord, open his eyes. It's a different yeah. type of opening day. But what did, uh, what did the servant then see when Elisha prayed for his eyes to be opened? Anybody want to fill in the blanks there? Mm -hmm. Mike Mullins got it. Yeah. Frank, you got it. Good job. Phil? Army of angels on the mountains. Right, but specifically, though, he said... Fiery. There, fiery. Chariots. Chariots, yes. He said there were horses and chariots of fire. Um, so it actually doesn't specifically mention angels, but we get the idea that it's a heavenly host that's there surrounding them. But, yeah, in 2 Kings chapter uh, 6, it tells us that there are horses. Now, were the horses of fire or just the chariots? I don't know. Either way, it's pretty cool, and, and, and I like that because, you know, I don't, I don't know that we all walk around with horses and chariots around us, but it does say that, the, that you know, the believers are protected, you know, by, by the angels in heaven, and, and I like that idea that sometimes we just need to pray that, God, help me to see what I can't see right now, because God is never leaves us or forsakes us, and he's always with us, so we need to have that opening day every day, right? So if you got that right, give yourself 23,406 points. And I got a couple more. This one's from the Old Testament. You just tell me who, who is uh, being referred to here. When he knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chambers open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Right. So here's another opening day. Right? Three times a day, he opened his windows and prayed towards Jerusalem. Anybody know who that is? Jennifer. That's Daniel. Yes, Daniel. it was Daniel. Obviously from the book of Daniel in chapter 6. That was uh, right before he got tossed into the, the den of lions. Right? That was, they, you know, the, the Persians had tricked them because they couldn't find any yeah. fault with Daniel. And they wanted to. The only thing they could find was... He prayed to his God religiously, right, three times a day. And so he had the king sign a decree that no one could pray to any other God except the king. And the king foolishly and very pridefully signed it. And then they realized, oh, hey, by the way, your trusted guy, Daniel, he's praying to another God. And the king didn't want to do it, but there's the laws of the Medes and the Persians that could not be changed. He threw Daniel lines in up. Obviously, uh, the Lord spared his life. And we read that later in Daniel chapter 6, but... I like that opening day, too. Yeah. You know, if that's your habit, you know, to pray to God, whether it's good times, bad times, you know, God will be there in the bad times, but you, you have to make it your practice. All right, if you got that right, give yourselves uh, 11 points. I, it's, inflation has caught up to us. <laughs> All right, there's two blanks here. This comes from uh, the book of Psalms, actually Psalm 24. It says, lift up your heads, O blank. And be lifted up, O ancient blank. Two different words. Lift up your heads, O blank. And be lifted up, O ancient blank. That the king of glory may come in. So it's a different. Uh, it's actually lift up is actually another way to say open up. Right? So in mm -hmm. Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O this. And be lifted up, O ancient blank. That the king of glory may come in. Pastor Vince worked for a company kind of like this back before he pastored. Um, we're filling in the blanks there. Anybody want to take a guess? Psalm 24. Let's see if anybody home is, is getting it. No, nope, not yet. Don't see the correct answer. Somebody's getting closer. Frank's getting closer, but not yet. Lift up your heads, O. Oh. Anybody want to take a shot? Say it, Dave. Gates. Gates, yes. And be lifted up, O oh, ancient. Doors. Doors, yes. Oh. Pastor Vince used to work for a... Uh, company that sold doors and, and hardware for doors but yes it's uh psalm 24 is 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 looking to the future king coming the messiah and it's talking about the gates that are around jerusalem the the, the walls of jerusalem had gates which we referred to earlier in new jerusalem they're never shut but in this case when the king comes they said be lifted up or be opened up O you gates O you ancient doors at the king of glory who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle that's the day we're, we're looking forward to so uh, Psalm 24, yeah, that, that was not an easy one, and uh, something that we refer to often, but I like the idea of that opening day, mm. and we'll be there. All believers will, will be there with him. Um, all right, last one from the um, book of Revelation. All right, there's 
uh, three blanks, but two of the blanks are the same word, and the, the third blank correlates. Okay, so I'm going to read the verse with the blanks, and then you just have to fill them in for me. Behold, I stand at the blank and do this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the blank, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. All right, so that's from the book of Revelation. Actually, Jesus is doing the speaking here. All right, I'll read it one more time. Behold, I stand at the blank and do this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the blank, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Anyone want to take a shot? Mike Mullins got mm -hmm. it. Joanne mm -hmm. Faber. Boy, the Fabers are pulling out all the stops tonight at home and here. Hey. What a team. They did Pastor Vince did famous <laughs> Bible couples. Now we do next week uh, yeah. famous Bible trivia couples. <laughs> Anybody want to tell me what the blanks are there? Alma? Door Correct. Yes, very good, Alma. Behold, I stand at the door. And I just realized I had door as the answer to two straight questions. But, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And that, that's the type of opening day we should have every day, right? Because Jesus is standing there knocking. And he never forces himself on us, but... He wants us to uh, hear his voice, to, to open the door to him, that he might have fellowship with us, and that he might eat with him, which means to partake with him and partake of him. So that's uh, that's the plan there. And uh, for getting that right, we'll give you 27,000 points. Oh, my goodness. Even. Wow. Yes. I he know, didn't Alma. realize it. He didn't realize it. He didn't realize it. Oh, I saw who it was, Alma. Good job. Mike Mullen said seven points online. He knew it. He got it right. <laughs> Alma's the closer. You know, she came in the bottom of the ninth. We needed we needed three straight outs, and Alma did it, man. Three straight pitches, one, two, three inning. Alma, good job. And that's all I have to say. Alma's going to lead us in a special prayer. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Top special one, prayer right? emphasis. Uh, lead us. Thank you for playing along. Our many segments. Good job. <laughs> Special prayer, the special prayer this week of a spiritual nature for our church is to pray for marriages. Now, again, I always like to give a word of explanation here. Yeah. Uh, we started out, this is actually steps here. We we're praying for, for, for young people as they became adults. We wanted them to, to, to choose, have Paul's prayer for spiritual wisdom, that they would stay with the faith that they were raised in not be swayed by the world. Or just. And so then we prayed for parents raising children to love their children uh, even when it's difficult to do and that that was important. Again, it's a, it's a step. So the step back from that then is for marriages. Obviously, marriages, that's hugely important for success in raising children for many reasons. For the example you're giving the children or what might be watching the marriage for your own, uh, you know, uh, cooperation and being together on, on the decisions you make and things like this. Uh, and when we give these requests, it's also s sort of like an exhortation too, like a reminder, like, hey, that's something that we want. We're praying for it. It means it's good and we should also strive for it in our personal lives. Uh, and I, I was at a church. We moved to another state years back and I went to a Sunday school class. It's a good class, big class, all these couples. Young couples, they all knew each other well. They were good friends. And in the class, though, the, the teacher was good, but the discussions were always very much like, uh, here's how I have that mastered. Here, uh, let me tell you, <laughs> that teacher just brought up that point. Let me tell you, here's how, here's how I, I do it right. So if anybody was ever considering saying, uh, hey, we're struggling with this. Hey, we need help with this. Like it, it would, it's hard enough to do, but yeah, it wasn't an atmosphere that where it was encouraged. I say that because years later I went back, I, I heard from the people from this class I was talking to, somebody was saying, yeah, well this one they got divorced, this one they got divorced, this one they got divorced. That's a shame. It's a testimony to the sinfulness of our human race, and I'm not throwing stones at them, but you know, the maybe the right things weren't being talked about in the class, and so. Yeah. It just uh, the uh, the reason for this request then is to keep it as the important things important, and to be focusing on the right things and 
that, that marriage is an important thing to pray for. So we're going to pray. You know, I see on the list here, pray for Pastor Vince, Pastor Greg. You can pray for their marriages, right? I mean, marriage takes, I don't know anything like, oh, there's trouble in marriage. <laughs> That's not where I'm going. But they're human beings, right? Sinful. And, and so pray for that. The deacon board. Pray for the deacons and their wives and their that they would have strong marriages. The deaconesses, which it doesn't list, right? But pray for them and their husbands, that they would have strong mar marriages. The, the, the people in the church. I thank God that we do have uh, many uh, uh, blessed marriages and their examples, good examples of marriage, and that's wonderful. And uh, But we just want to pray, pray, pray. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you so much for the gift of marriage that you, you thought of in your mind and you put it into the human race to do it and uh, to be a picture of our relationship to you, Lord. And I just thank you for the, uh, the, uh, the wonderful blessing that it is. But we also come to you, Lord, as needy people. Uh, we are the, the tax collector who says, we are sinners, Lord. We need your help. We do not come to you as the Pharisee who says, we've got this. Uh, we, we recognize that we need your Holy Spirit to help us overcome our sinful natures and we're doing our relationships, uh, the, the selfishness, the pride, the things that hurt our relationships, Lord. We, we need your Holy Spirit to, to grow us and to, to be Christ-like in all of our relationships, especially our marriages, and I just pray, Lord, that you would help us continue to make this a, a strong church in that area. And uh, we, we, we don't, uh, well, we don't uh, would ever name names. We wouldn't list people. But we know that the, the chances are, Lord, the number is the size of our church, that there would be people uh, hurting, people in this area needing your help. Uh, and so we just pray as a church, uh, for a special touch in the area of marriages. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> Enjoy having these little different prayer segments that we, you know, prayer for missionary, prayer for a ministry emphasis, and a prayers that we lift up at the end. Jen, if you're sitting there wondering, when are these points ever going, what do I get? They're, no. don't, they're just... Hey, 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 we don't know that. You know, it's good to come here with it's good to come here with holy pockets. Like that, the, the points have a way of falling out, and uh, there'll be a redemption. But, yeah, okay, someday maybe there will be. Someday, wouldn't that be something if he's actually been calculating all these points? And, you know, I have a memory from my childhood. That's no shock to many of you, right? But um, but on this one, I only really remember one thing. Tom, I don't know if you remember it. Because I was young, but so you would have been younger. But I remember my dad being on the back, laying in the backyard in agony. You remember that day? Now, I don't know if we were playing baseball, Dad, or wiffle ball. Wiffle ball. But rarely did our family play a game in the backyard with my mom, my dad, and all that. We were playing wiffle ball, and my dad tripped over. I don't have a lot of memories of, of the whole day. What I see it, my dad... Tripped over the pitcher's mound, right? He tw I sprained his ankle. All I remember is seeing my dad go, oh, down on the ground. My dad writhing in pain. Oh, almost like, he said, like, oh. I, 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 you know, I, I, it's all I can. Like, it's really what I see. Now, you say to dad, like, oh, yeah, I sprained an ankle. Oh. But I wasn't an adult. I was, I was. This was, I had never, ever seen my dad in that situation. Now, I'm well aware that that means I had a blessed childhood. There are some people that, you know, experienced tremendous pain. And, but I never saw my dad helpless. Dad's down. My world is completely vulnerable. <laughs> in other words, he was kind of, I hadn't come to know the Lord as my Savior yet, you know, and he was our rock, our security, and if dad's laying in the yard helpless, we're all in trouble, right? That sense. And I can still see it kind of, you know, in my, in my child mind. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it, he sprained his ankle. I get it. But for what I was experiencing, I know it hurt. But, 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 but was it, 
Did I, did I have at least a little, tiny little taste of what it was like for Peter, James, and John when they glimpsed something they never saw before in the Garden of Gethsemane? When they saw their master down. Now, it's Wednesday now, night. And we, if, you look at, if you look at the life of Christ, the last week, a lot of people refer to this day as Silent Wednesday because we read of nothing happening. Probably on Wednesday was when Judas went and literally made the deal to, to, to set up Jesus. But we call it Silent Wednesday because we don't know of anything specifically happening that day. They have no idea that in 24 hours how dramatically their world is going to change. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows. And Jesus specifically takes Peter, John, and James into the garden with them to see something. What did they see? Hebrews chapter 5 tells us what they saw, right? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There's the one phrase I'm gearing at there, right? His vehement cries and tears. Jesus expressed there it is you talk about you know my mind being scarred at a little young age that's down. <sighs> to see the master vehement cries and tears how do we know that's what happened only because well the lord reveals it in his scripture but it's revealed through his vessels who were there they saw it. Peter, James, and John. We often think about the story of the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus kind of says, all right, you guys, stay with me here. And he goes off, and they're like, whew, and off to sleep they go. But that's not the reality of what happened. You know, I remember when I would go to soccer camp. I mean, my uh, one of one of my roommates, our, our roommate in college, who was also on the soccer team, Dave Knox, fastest guy I ever saw fall asleep in my life. Never saw, never saw anybody fall. Dave was always in a deep sleep within the first minute that he laid down. Every time I, I you know, and, and I remember we get on soccer camp. You know, we'd get a break in the middle of the afternoon, a lot of practice in the morning. Usually didn't practice at the heat of the day, right? And later in the day, we would get after lunch, get to the, the little, our little like huts, our little rack time. Whew, time to go to sleep. That was all we had. Dave was out. I mean, just, just amazes me. I, I, I had to ask him, is that stayed with him through life? I kind of pictured that, you know, sometimes you get in your mind be like the disciples were like, all right, Jesus has gone racked up. That's not what happened, right? It's much more that they battled. You know, we'll watch our British crime shows. I've said that. And there are literally times where we finish dinner, sitting there watching, you know, when it's just the two of you watching, you know, and, 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 and I'm into the show. I mean, it's got a good storyline and I'm, and I'm, Wake up, what will happen? Did I miss anything? Did I miss anything? Huh, and I really want to watch it. But after falling asleep like three times in five minutes, I'd say, yeah, you know what, let's just let's just watch something goofy because I, I, I don't want to miss the details of this show. And so I can change the channel. They couldn't. They're exhausted, right? But Jesus has purposely brought them to witness this event for them and for us. We read that in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, you, you, you may well be familiar with the stories, right? In Matthew chapter 26, and we read there in verse 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. 
and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. That's all of them. But then he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So they see him starting to agonize. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Verse 39 tells us what? He went a little farther. New American Standard says, a little beyond them. Right? That's what Matthew tells us. Luke tells us what? In Luke chapter 22, he gives us some details, right? In verse 41, he says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. Now, how long is that? Well, it depends. I don't have a good arm, so he would be closer if it was me throwing the stone. Maybe if it was uh, Mike Mullen throwing the stone, he was a catcher throwing people out at second base. You know, Dave, would you throw the javelin? Yep. And, you know, how could you, how far could you throw a javelin? 180 feet. Oh, good for you. 180 feet, man. Anyhow, you know, he however, so 180 feet, right? Maybe throwing a stone, a javelin, whatever. But my point is he was close enough for them to see it and observe it because Mark tells us in Mark chapter 14, right? In Mark chapter 14, verse 35, he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. So Mark tells us what? He fell to the ground. We saw him. He went down. Jesus is down. Think about the impact on them. They're not sleeping, or else they wouldn't be telling us this. Do they fall asleep? Yes. Are they fighting sleep? Yes. But they're awake. They're seeing it. He's down. I mean, think about the what they're seeing on the face of Jesus. This is not the face they saw on the boat when Jesus calmed the storm. This face looks very different. That face was so assuring. This face to them is so alarming, right? They hear his cries. It has to be so unsettling for them. One writer says it was entirely deliberate. Jesus could certainly have suffered this agony in solitary privacy, but he determined that there be witnesses to it close enough to behold the scene because he wanted this scene to be recorded. This was the hour when he was most obviously human. I don't mean there was times that he was more human than other times. I mean, this is the time that so displayed his humanity in its weakness and agony, suffering at the immense weight of, I know many commentators will say he's not agonizing over the physical aspect. I don't agree with that. I know his agony is the spiritual weight of sin. I know that. But that sometimes anesthetize, anesthetizes, am I saying it right, the, 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 the scene. As if it was just like doctrinal. As if, you know, he died, but he really just died like spirit. No, he, he, the, the scene is powerful for us to know what? The writer to the Hebrews tells us what? And uses very descriptive words in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, Right? Because they want us to know what these witnesses were watching in Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. This is a, a, an agony because as the Son of God, he is carrying the weight of sin. But make no mistake, they are seeing a human being in agony because he is going to taste wretched death. Someone has said that death is our daily companion, right? It, we, in other words, we always know 
that that and apart from Christ, it is a it is a constant fear unless we push it out of our mind and, and ignore it. But Jesus was, they saw the agony of Jesus as he prepared to taste, taste what a word, to, of what? Experience. He experienced everything about death. It's hard to watch. And yet, did Jesus prepare these three specifically for this moment? In one sense, he had, right? When we stop and think about what had Jesus done with Peter, James, and John, and why? I believe he did it to prepare them for that moment. They were going to be the ones to see Jesus in agony in the garden. And so what did he do with them? Well, in Mark chapter 5, we see in verse 35 that while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Jairus, your daughter is dead. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Now, verse 37, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. Jesus only takes Peter, James, and John. This is not James, the author of the book of James, letter of James, those of you in that Sunday school class know that, right? That it's just a, that was James, the kind of brother of Jesus. This is James, the brother of John, who is the first who gets martyred, right? But they get to see what? They get to see this daughter raised from the dead. Jesus takes them in. They see the dead girl, verse 41. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked. They get to see that. I didn't. You didn't. We weren't in the room to watch that. Neither was Thomas, right? Neither was, you, you know, Bartholomew. Neither were any of you know, the, 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 the women that followed him, right? But Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus raise that man, that girl from the dead. Now, they all got to see him raise Lazarus, right? Not that long before Gethsemane. But he gave them this special gift of seeing that child, his ability to give life. And of course, he did something else with them, right? In Mark chapter 9. For in Mark chapter 9, it's recorded elsewhere, but in Mark chapter 9 and verse 2, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white. Elijah, Moses appear, a voice from heaven. God says, this is my son. Listen to him. So we have Jesus taking Peter, James, and John. Hey, come with me. And they get to see a little girl risen from the dead. Jesus, Peter, James, John, come with me. And they get to see the transfiguration, the glory of Jesus. And now Jesus says, Peter, James, and John, come with me. Oh, man, what are we going to get to see? Right? And what they see is their master in a state that they have never, ever seen him in. And it is devastating to them. Mixed with their exhaustion, they just perhaps can't look, look away. They, they, they're, they're struggling. What is happening? And, and off to sleep, they go. And what happens? Even though Jesus prepared them for it, when he asks them to stay awake in prayer, they're unable, right? And the three of them do what? They honestly share how they failed. Like when we read in Matthew's gospel, right, uh, of that event unfolding, it may be Matthew that's the one, right, that's, that's telling us about it. You know, Matthew's the one that says, and Jesus came back, you know, where, where am I here? Um, in, uh, I lost my place. Anyhow, prayer in the garden. Matthew chapter 26 
and we read, you know, watch and pray. Verse 42, he comes back a second time. Oh, he says, what, you know, you're still asleep. He comes back a third time. Are you still sleeping? The thing is this, look how honest they are. What I, I've said it before. I'll say it till I can't anymore. One of the things that jumps out to me to scripture is how credible it is. It is so credible. Anybody who thinks that this is a bunch of guys sitting in a room making up a story, these things just wouldn't be in it. You're not going to be the leaders of a, of a religion and, and let everyone see that in the moment the Savior needed you, you failed him. And that's what they share. I love what one writer says. It is important to reflect that we are acquainted with the failures of these three apostles because they are the ones who testify to it. They're the ones who tell us. Right? Over and over again, he came back. We failed him. We went to sleep again. He came back. We failed him. We failed him. Jesus clearly, when the moment that he needed us humanly, we let him down. His deepest hour of need. I love that they're honest with that. I really do. Now, just that, you know, as you were saying with our lives, whether it be a marriage, whether it be parenting, whether it be for us to as believers, oh, how refreshing it is when someone says, listen, oh, I have, I have failed so many times. I've stumbled. Up. God's grace is so amazing. God is so good. I'm so undeserving. Oh, there is something so uh, beautiful about a humble heart that says, I dropped the ball. I, I, I thought I would be able to, and, and I failed. I was weak. I stumbled. I struggled. Now, do we, do we want to, to find victory? Absolutely, right? You know, you know, shall we sin so that grace would abound? No, Paul says. But what I love about it is these two guys say, they're the, they, they, come, they tell us. Peter and John are two of the ones who it's their eyewitness testimony that is recorded here and in Hebrews and everywhere. And yet Peter's the one who says, even though I was the one who failed him, you know what? I can tell you this. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. He never stopped caring for us. Never stopped caring for us. John says, you know what? Even though I failed him, I want you to know this. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the Lord. So, so that, that sense of, oh, rest, what a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. We don't have to hide. We don't have to pretend. We just say, Lord, I failed you. Forgive me. He's our advocate. He says, don't worry. I'm still going to the cross for you. I'm still leaving the garden for you. I'm tasting death for you. Paul would later say, right, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the one who, what? Died for me, right? The one who saved me, died for me personally. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And so, we have that Savior who understands our suffering. And so we like to close with some prayer for some specific needs, right? Some specific prayer requests that relate to our human needs, right? We prayed for the missionaries, prayed uh, for the church family, and for some specific needs, right? Uh, Lonnie Clayton, we're praising God with Lonnie. I saw him online here, praising God with him. The pain patch is giving him some relief, but keep praying for it, Lonnie. Bobby Fox, how's his pneumonia coming along? Yes, sir. Coming along. Praise the Lord for that. Katrina, my daughter-in-law, has a sinus infection, but she, the antibiotics, are helping greatly. We'll be praying for Michelle Fox. Got a new dialysis machine. Her and Jonathan both have six-hour training today to learn how to use it properly. So we want to be praying for them. Right? Did I get that right? I thought she said her and Jonathan both had. Yeah. Yeah. Lily Ford has been, ever since she's come out of the hospital, dealing with some real back pain. Mm -hmm. We want to continue to pray for her. Penny Groh's been watching. She has transitioned to Magnolia Gardens. 
We thank God that she remains uh, able to join with us. Tula Chandler has been in the hospital for three weeks with this infection. Um, but some, some good improvement today. Some of the drains will be removed. They're waiting on the liver, but we, we thank the Lord for some of them being uh, removed. Christine began her five weeks straight, one day a week of being on this Sol Solaris, this powerful chemo drug. She has it again tomorrow. And so, Christine, we're praying for you. We, 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 your testimony stands out. We're so glad you're here, but we want to be praying for Christine, lifting her up to the Lord. Uh, good to see, I think, Keely Sampson. I think, I don't know if you're still on here, Keely. Keely and her family are away, uh, traveling, uh, So, but we'll be praying for their safety. And any other prayer requests you have here tonight that you want to lift up to us? Anybody have something? Anybody online? I don't know if anybody uh, sent in a special prayer request. I certainly can look right here and see. But I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any. All right. Anybody have a, an item you want us to close with in prayer specifically? Frank? Well, um, my friend David Simone, tomorrow I'm going to invite him out to that play to, on Friday. To play, yeah. Okay. Because I'm thinking the spin I can put on it is it's a play and we're all going to have fun and these guys are getting together and say some lines. So maybe I can get him to come for that. Okay. And the other thing, there's a woman that I met through my doggy ministry. And by that I mean I'm driving in my car and I see people walking a dog and I roll the window down and I tell them how precious their dog is. And sometimes they keep going, but sometimes they stop. <laughs> sometimes they run. Sometimes they stop. I'm kidding. <laughs> I pull over and I sit down and I make my face available for them to put their nose on my face. The dog? The dog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's more than I'm putting her face yeah. on my face now. Yeah. But she's a real sweetheart. And I'm going to ask her. She walks around 3 o'clock, so I take my walk to exercise for Israel at 3 o'clock. Okay. And the other thing is, she has met Michelle Pfeiffer and Al Pacino. She was involved in the film industry. Oh, my. And she was friends with Betty White, Rue Clanahan, and she showed me pictures. Okay. So she can tell amazing stories. So I'm going to pray that David will come and pray that Terry pray will come. Pray that David will come. And that Terry will come. Right. And uh, Mike Mullen says, pray for my friend Ron Abarelli for an upcoming procedure. Yeah, I know Ron. Okay, with the kidney stone. Yeah, All right. He's talking about is Friday evening, 7 p.m. Right. Friday evening is the event. He's going to invite them tomorrow, but it's Friday evening. Pastor Leo. Tina, um, Gary and Kathy's daughter, Tina, just had her, her, her second miscarriage, and so we just want to be praying for her. Okay. I don't want to say last names with any help this moment, but all right. I'm going to lift up in prayer, and uh, we'll close. Remember, Friday night, Friday night, um, 7 o'clock, Good Friday service, the reenactment of Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you hear us always. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to lift up these names to you that are suffering, hurting, aching. We ask for healing, Lord. We ask for your presence to be such, just so so clearly felt that, that it, would, it would just change the moment for people in need right now. That they might sense your arms wrapped around them, your, that you might open a door for their peace and deliverance, give them the grace to sustain them in the midst of a trial. We lift up these lives to you, Lord, and we ask for you to be glorified in the midst of them all, 
Lord, we ask for this weekend, Friday night, Sunday. Father, we would, we, our desire is to see <coughs> folks come to know Jesus as their Savior. We ask you, Lord, only you can do it. We can't. So we ask you, if you would allow, Lord, we ask you to open the eyes of the lost through our ministry this coming weekend, Lord. Let us rejoice in lives that come to know you throughout this Easter weekend. We ask you that, Lord. We, we beg you. We want to see new believers. And so we ask that you would bring them in and let them respond to your Holy Spirit's prodding of the gospel. We pray it for your glory in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining us online. Good to see you folks tonight. God bless you all.